All right. Uh, welcome, everybody, to uh, our LinkedIn Live. Uh, this is the topic of evolving the evolving world of pass keys uh, from theory to uh, adoption. One of uh, one of the things that uh, Boyan and I had in one of our previous last uh, LinkedIn Lives that we were talking about was kind of going down a path of a, a introductory to pass keys, but we were afforded an opportunity to get some uh, wonderful guests to join us. And uh, just talk about passkeys in general uh, in a context that is not uh, driven solely by by hyper, but driven by just the industry and, and the standards and where we see it from multiple different avenues. Uh, and as with us as normal, uh, Boyan is with us. Would you go ahead and uh, do a quick introduction there, Boyan? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Ryan. Happy birthday, by the way. Belated a little bit. Um, but uh, Boyan, co-founder, CEO of Hyper. Uh, been on this journey of deploying passkeys as we know them now uh, for the better part of a decade, which is crazy to think about. Uh, but it's been an incredible thing to be a part of. And I get to work with really smart people like Ryan and get to uh, collaborate with really smart people like Tom and Dean, who are joining us today. So fellas, introduce yourselves, please. I am Tom Sheffield. I'm the Senior Director of Cybersecurity at Target, and I lead our Global Identity Access Management Program. Uh, we've been on our journey for about five years now uh, and have deployed FIDOs as a primary authenticator for our enterprise uh, for almost three now. So it's been a fun time to watch the technology continue to mature and evolve, and, and Passkeys has been the latest evolution, and uh, we continue to, to make strides to, to get that fully deployed in our environment as well. And I'm Dean Sachs, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Senior Security Engineer with uh, AWS Identity. Uh, and I'm also the co-chair of the FIDO Alliance's Enterprise Deployment Working Group. Uh, today, I'm going to be speaking on behalf of AWS Identity, however. Um, and I've been engaged with uh, the FIDO Alliance for about six years now, representing Amazon within the FIDO Alliance um, and um, uh, working on the deployment of uh, FIDO technologies, U2F, UAF, FIDO2, and now Passkeys. Yeah, and I'm I'm pretty excited, Dean, that we actually get to do this live together because normally we just catch us catch us uh, in passing at on the conference circuit, and then as well right. as at the board meetings and the plenary. So I'm I'm really happy that we get to have a, an open dialogue uh, that gets to be recorded. So it's proof that you and I do have communication. Um, so we we do have a, a lightweight agenda. This is going to be very um, loose. There's only going to be some slides that are going to act as visual aids. But the, the main topics that we wanted to cover during this time uh, with this amazing group of individuals is just in general, the types of pass keys, because this is actually a, a topic that that strains quite a few in the market. Uh, and I could also say that there can be um, some misinformation that floats out in some forums. So hopefully we can clarify some of that in this this time together. Uh, we definitely want to talk about where pass keys can be used, because I think there's there's some gaps in, in a lot of what the market understands. Uh, and what what does uh, what is the passkey threat model? And I'm going to definitely put that mostly on Mr. Uh, Dean and Tom, as they have made this a topic of their their circuits, uh, as well as how can how can I use passkeys in a regulated environment? This is another key topic that comes up quite a bit, and I think is a uh, near and dear to all of us that are on this LinkedIn Live. So to kick it off, the the first one I'm going to hit which is the types of pass keys that are out there and this is going to be more or less an open dialogue i don't want to be the one doing all the talking so uh i'll actually hand it over to you boy and you can give a kind of quick quick little teaser out there if you like yeah the really cool thing about pass keys is uh, the fido alliance itself has been working on a new way of doing authentication on the internet for many years now and kind of what we've all aligned on is Basically, any FIDO credential is a passkey. Uh, the traditional uh, FIDO U2F UAF uh, authenticators have been used by various relying parties in decent capacity over the years. But what's really started driving a ton of interest and in adoption in passkeys in particular is the involvement of the large platform providers such as Apple, Google, Microsoft uh, in particular, who provide a lot of the devices that we carry in our hands uh, with integrated authenticators. Uh, so there's many different types of authenticators. You can plug them into a mobile app like we do at Hyper. You can put them into badges, hardware tokens like YubiKeys, Titan Keys, so on and so forth. Many of our favorite password managers 
uh, also support passkeys today, which is really awesome to see. I think it's resulting in in a, a decent amount of adoption itself. Um, and, and it's really nice to see, you know, that that entire ecosystem starting to work together and standards being created to make sure that the end users have a consistent and secure user experience. I think, you know, say what you will about passwords themselves, but they are very consistent and anybody knows how to use them. And so until we are on par from a user experience perspective uh, with pass keys, I think it's going to be a, a mountain to climb. But I think we're getting there, especially in the last three or four years. I feel it being in this space, um, you know, the number of organizations that we talk to that are adopting pass keys, FIDO based authentication is skyrocketing and it's just a, it's a fun time to be around and it comes after many years of a lot of hard work by a lot of people uh, within the FIDO Alliance and other standards bodies to make it happen so I'll stop yapping there and um, you know see if Tom or Dean have any thoughts I think um, <clears throat> Boyan you make a great point about the ubiquity of passwords and everyone knows what a password is. Everyone knows how a password works. They may not know how it's stored service side. Uh, they may not know about the attack patterns for passwords, et cetera, but they know what they are and they're very familiar with them. And this is one of the, the major challenges we have in, in the FIDO world now in the passkey world is getting users familiar with this technology and getting them comfortable with this technology and understanding where it replaces passwords um, and where it might not replace passwords. Because I think ultimately there are places where passwords will continue to survive long after we get ubiquity with pass keys in the marketplace. There are going to be fewer and fewer places, but um, they are the easiest credential to use. And sometimes ease of use is exactly what we need as opposed to the strongest credential. Now that will depend on your particular threat model and your use cases, but um but working to to promote pass keys in all of the places where they can be used with all the different mechanisms that we can use to to deploy them, whether it's mobile applications, platform devices, hardware security keys, password managers, et cetera, is the 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 hard work that we are all undertaking right now. And I'll go a step further and say not only is it the customers becoming comfortable with with pass keys, understanding them and becoming comfortable, but it's also the RPs. And that's why forums like this. That's why that circuit that was re referenced before is so critical. Uh, these are the forums where we help the RPs understand what is a passkey, how can it be used, how should it be used, what should be what should you be considering about using passkeys or having passkeys in your environment. I hope today that some of that information comes out. That if you're not yet on your journey or unsure wh whether or not you should be on your journey, hopefully with today's conversation and others like it, uh, you recognize that this is time for me to act. I, we need to do something as an industry. To, to continue to drive the, the use of passwords down and or out wherever possible. And, and on that information dialogue journey there, Tom, I just realized that I completely and utterly failed on this slide with the password managers. They're not hardware tokens. They're not device bound. They're, they're <laughs> not in that category. And that is a 100% failure on my part. So I will eat that failure. Um, so that anybody who does watch this in a, in a recorded context or is enjoying this live moment is sitting there going, Password managers and device bound doesn't work. You're hundred percent correct. I failed on a slide. So I will eat that. We'll get you every time. <laughs> Copy and paste. <laughs> totally own me on this one. Um, I, and then I'll, I'll find some way to, you know, blame somebody on a review. Oh, you guys didn't catch it. That's not my fault. Um, <laughs> but hopefully uh, I think we, know, all, we all missed that one. You know? <laughs> um, I, I, I would say though, that there's been this, this approach, right. With, with, looking at what we have in forms of supporting how to transition out of out of the password world that that you were talking about boy I'm like look it's so ingrained in society it's so ingrained in us as as people even if you're on the older side of the spectrum you know passwords if you're on the younger side maybe pass keys are going to be what you just know um but the platforms are are doing what they can to enable this so quickly um i mean we are, we've had conversations over and over again where you know we talked about just the adoption of face ID or touch ID on mobile devices were were a wee bit of a challenge for the market to start accepting, and then we got there right. Like eventually, it became a thing. Um, so but I the think the way we, we got there is interesting, right? 
because the way we got there was you couldn't use on an Apple device touch ID initially until you had set up a pin. And so for those users who had devices that had no pins and were effectively open to the world, they didn't get the benefit of touch ID until they installed, until they configured a pin. And so there was um, a nudge uh, in the sense of, of Cass Sunstein and Richard Thaler's book nudge um, or, or some social pressure to make users do the secure thing. And that may be exactly what we need here with pass keys to nudge users into the right behavior to help secure their own interactions with RPs, relying parties, whether it's Google or Amazon or, or any other RP out there, Target, et cetera. Yeah. And just from the recent stats that we've seen, like, you know, Google made uh, pass keys, I believe a default <clears throat> and, um, and, and, just them being able to, at their scale, say like, oh, it, it improved login speeds by 40%, I think it was. Like, th those numbers speak very loudly, especially when you look at industries such as financial services or e-commerce uh, or, or travel and booking, especially, you know, situations where users have a plethora of choices and they're going to go after the one that's the easiest to use. Um and passkeys provide a much easier option, especially if it's a service that you don't use every single day. Uh, there's few things more frustrating than having to log into some website where you, you log in maybe once a month and you have to uh, you have to type in a credential. Um, it can be very frustrating, but I think this is a good opportunity to kind of tell the listeners a little bit more about some of the differences of the types of passkeys. Um, I think if we go to the next slide, Dean, you had posted this diagram originally. I think it was at the FIDO Authenticate Conference. That's where I first saw it. Um, but you know, I'm sure you, you probably showed it other places before. But this yeah. concept yeah, of we, we talked, of passkeys. Yeah, we talked about this at Ident Identiverse uh, initially. Um, and so this is the Venn diagram of passkeys, right? Because passkeys exist in multiple different in multiple different formats, in multiple different ways. They all functionally work <clears throat> in a very similar way um, and they have similar properties, but there are some key properties that are dependent upon how you deploy a passkey. A passkey that is deployed on a hardware security key, such as a Yubi key or a key from Facian or the Titan key has different security properties from those that are bound into a password manager, whether it's one password or dash lane, or even those that are bound to a hard, um, are, 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 are uh, bounded to your platform, uh, micro, uh, whether it's Google or Apple, et cetera. And so we have to be able to distinguish uh, the, the differences between different pass keys because they may, those differences may make a difference in the higher security use cases. For logging into Slashdot, for instance, maybe I don't care, but if I'm logging into my bank or I'm logging into uh, other financial services or healthcare, uh, or maybe I'm using them in an enterprise context, that's where we need to really begin to distinguish synced passkeys, device-bound passkeys, and the different properties between them. And this is something we've recognized in the hardware security key realm for a long time. And you can see this in the, in the distinction between the security levels that different hardware securities can meet, where there are, are you know, 120 odd uh, hardware devices that meet the L1 or the baseline security requirements of the FIDO Alliance, but there are only about 20 that meet the L2 security requirements, which is a step above, has a much higher bar to achieve that. And so this is a differentiation that we collectively need to help the market understand in order to deploy these things correctly um, to meet the different risk requirements of different uh, deployment scenarios. So, I mean, with that, like we would just kind of spent a little bit on the education of the types of pass keys. And then now that we have a kind of more or less a new threat model, Tom, I, you've been on your journey and I'm pretty sure you've had to go through a, a threat modeling exercise multiple times. Mm -hmm. What was that experience a little bit like for you in that transition, right? Because we've all come from passwords, MFA and all sorts of other things. So this, it's a pretty big pivot, right? In that model. What, was there anything that, that stood out or made what was a challenge or actually was easier to overcome in conversation? Uh, it, it's all, it's been a challenge, right? We are, we are, uh, in the forefront here. I was, I was uh, doing a check the other day. I saw a statistic that somebody mentioned that there's now, uh, in passkeys.directory, there's now over a hundred 
RPs globally that have deployed passkeys. And that's not an all-inclusive list, but that is a pretty impressive growth. Um, but for every one of them, they've had to go through a similar exercise and, and Dean touched on it. It's about identifying what am I protecting and then what level of protection do I need for that? Uh, and, and I think the examples Dean gave are great. I'll, I'll say as, as a consumer, I'll, I'll, I'll take off my RP hat, just as a personal consumer, when I log into my bank, my 401k with just a, a password and an OTP, uh, being as, as, as much of an advocate for FIDO as I am, I get frustrated. Like, why, why can't I protect my 401k the way that I want to be protected? Cause I know that's my future. And so I, I, I hope that again, that, that we continue to get out there, but I think it comes down ultimately to what are you trying to protect? And then whether or not, uh, what, what type of passkey or authenticator in general do you think that you need that goes along with that? Uh, it was mentioned the other day that MFA is really built on the premise. Uh, it, it evolved from a time when we knew that our first factor was weak, right? Your password is a weak credential. And so we, we layered uh, MFA on top of it, which makes sense. I think Microsoft publishes, publishes a statistic that says like 99% of ATO attacks are stopped with 2FA. And I think that's absolutely true. It'll stop an opportunistic attack, but it's not going to uh, stop a, a, a target attacker who's trying to build their livelihood off of your failure, your demise. And so uh, FIDO is something that will help us protect against that. And so uh, if you need to do MFA because your auditor says so, is check the box. Okay. But it still feels wrong. I, I would still say let's let's strengthen the first factor first, and then worry about the se- whether or not you need a second factor at all. Sort of second. Yeah, and really, when we look at any types of pass keys, whether they're synced or device bound, either option is overwhelmingly better than using a password. Um, you you really cannot go wrong either way here. Um, and then once you get into the the device map passkeys and the differences and the nuances, it really starts to have applicability around specific types of attacks that are very much targeted and directed um, at a specific user that become uh, that become top of mind. And, and those attacks are really difficult to execute at scale or in an automated fashion. Um, but, you know, from a synced passkey perspective, when I talk about passkeys, I'm typically referring by default to synced passkeys because that's getting the, the most attention these days. And the value that I see from our customers getting from that in particular is, hey, you know what? When when my users get a new iPhone every October, they don't have to type their password in when they download my banking app to log in. Uh, that on its own is a major benefit to organizations. And from a threat model perspective, once a user enrolls a passkey, you can you can have a much more easy way to monitor risk for that user because if they're using a passkey as a default option and then for some reason they go back to using a password, that's a situation from a threat model perspective where you really want to pay a lot of attention because that should never happen ideally. Like you know, because if they enroll in a passkey, the only way that they would go back to using a password is if you know if they if they maybe switch platforms entirely and don't have any of their old devices the those scenarios should be so rare that it makes sense to take a deeper look at those situations and investigate them further i think i, I think, think you kind of great... do... oh sorry dean i was going to i was actually going to tease but... something into you real quick which was going to okay, come go from for it. it was going to come from uh, the words that that Boyan was actually just describing around risk and having a different kind of risk profile so we're talking about a passkey threat model here but a lot of businesses have a, a much bigger risk model overall for the interactions. And, and I think, Boyan, you kind of hit it a little bit where it's reusing the same private key over and over again has a different signature to it than the same password. Or it's kind of inverted, right? Which then, Dean, this comes into we're talking about risk engines and context um, being a little bit different because of pass keys. And that's that's right. Um uh, my, my friend Shane Whedon from IBM, who's a contributor to the FIDO Alliance and to W3C and the WebAuthn Working Group, um, ha- has said very clearly, don't turn off your risk engines. Um, when you make that migration from passwords to passkeys, your risk engines don't go away, but the signatures they're looking for may start to change. And I think that is a, a a critical piece of information that we need to, to share with folks who are deploying passkeys because passkeys are not a risk-free endeavor. Um, they are a better credential, 
but it doesn't mean there aren't threats to those paskies. And again, it depends on the particular nature of the paskey itself and how it's deployed. Again, hardware versus uh, a, a hardware, a device bound paskey versus a synced paskey. Uh, but it can even depend on the particular uh, syncing platform and the mechanisms they use to protect their user accounts. Because one of the things that you see is ultimately you wind up bootstrapping that user account with a password. And maybe an MFA device, maybe it's a, uh, a, a hardware key as a second factor, or maybe it's SMS OTP, but there are other, uh, but you have to bootstrap that, that password manager or that credential manager in some way. And there's some risk that comes in there because, of course, that could be the place where attackers start to go next. So, um, so keep those risk engines running, start retuning them for a world that is based upon passkeys uh, and think about the new threats that come into play as we begin centralizing all of our credentials in these uh, passkey providers, whether they're platforms or third-party password managers. Yeah, if, if I was to fast forward, let, let, let's go a year from now, two years from now, wh- whether it's industry-wide or just you as an RP, as you think about your deployment of passkeys, when you reach that success, success point, I think the key is that we're going to find that the attackers are going to have to pivot, right? If they if they can't get your path, get in through a password and whatever form of MFA you put behind it, they're going to try and figure out other ways to get in. They're not going to go home and say, well, I guess my job's over now and I'm going to go get a legitimate job now. They're going to figure out a new way to get in. So now we're looking at those downgrade attacks. Where are you using passwords? Where, where are you still relying on passwords? Is it that bootstrapping flow? Is it the account unlock? Is it a password reset flow? Where do you have passwords still in your environment? And how, how are you, do, what are you doing to protect them uh, in the same way that you're doing the reasons you're trying to deploy FIDO? Uh, how are you protecting the sessions and token information, right? Those compromises are going to be next, right? They're not going to try and log in anymore. They're going to get a user who's, who's already logged in, who's, who's already performed that MFA step, right? And they're going to try and, and ride their coat, ride their coattails and, and be able to get into your environment. So you got to be thinking about those things next. That's Mm -hmm. right. And there's a a great presentation from Sarah Handler from Identiverse 2022 uh, when she was at Microsoft, where she talks about the prevalence of bearer token theft uh, and bearer token theft being a new uh, attack pattern that we're seeing in order to bypass MFA. Because once the user is already authenticated, if you can steal that bearer token, that session cookie, et cetera, then it's game over for the user. You've already, you've bypassed the MFA, you've bypassed the authentication step. You're one step beyond that. And now once you steal that token, you can emulate that user. It definitely comes into the new world of wh- where the attack vectors are going to become more prevalent because no longer is the password something you can go scrape off the dark web. No longer is it something that's just floating out there or it's, you know, one, two, three, four, five, or password is password. Um, but there is one thing that I want, like we, we keep bringing up MFA and I think, you know, we, we have a, a challenge in industry with especially regulation and, and compliance where I don't know where this is, how long it's going to take before compliance and auditors are going to accept passkeys as, as a stronger authenticator than, than say, obviously a password. And we do have a marker in the middle of the Venn diagram that says second factor, um, which is going to team me into the next slide since we, we are doing pretty good on time, which is our passkeys themselves considered MFA. And I know, uh, boy, you put this up uh, on your LinkedIn a little while ago with a, an additional column, but I think it's a really good description of some of the challenges that I know I've talked to customers about and, and prospects and, and just and people in the industry is that, well, I have an MFA requirement. How's this passkey going to meet that MFA? Because my auditor is not checking the box on this right now how do we start communicating and realizing that you know pass keys are better they serve a specific purpose and i think dean actually all three of you guys tom dean and boy and we're talking about picking the right pass key for the use case um and where that security model falls so i'm mean, gonna open this back up to you boy on as, as this kind of is a little bit in, in your corner from the mfa standpoint um from your previous post yeah i, I think we're we're in it we're at an interesting time right now where we have this technology pass keys that are widely available and anybody can implement them. And they're way better than a shared secret credential. And by a shared secret credential, I mean a password or an OTP or, or things that people type in. But at the same time, we have the regulatory bodies who have to check certain boxes around multiple factors of authentication. And it's one of those situations where 
we have to be able to check those boxes in order to be compliant uh, because there's significant consequences if we're not. But at the same time, we want to also improve the user experience. And so, you know, I think this is probably one of the more debated things in the FIDO world right now, where is a passkey that is synced through my Google or my Apple account or through my password manager considered multi-factor? Um, and I think different people have different opinions on this, but the regulatory, the, the companies that we work with that are heavily regulated tend to be more on the cautious side. And they say, hey, you know what? We're not we're not going to consider this MF, a synced passkey as MFA on its own because of these reasons. We do not have you know, significant proof that this user is always this user on this device if this thing can be airdropped to other people, for example. Um, and that's, I think, you know, that that's a very valid opinion to have. It really doesn't uh, negate the fact that passkey in any shape or form is way more secure than a password and an OTP. I think from any serious security practitioner's perspective, though. So, but it, Tom, I'm it, gonna I'm gonna go call ahead. on you on this part, right, right, quick, because I mean you're obviously uh, you're spending a lot of time from a, a consumer, and you you know have had some some auditors or some work happening, and we're trying to go through some of this process. What was your experience like? Yeah, I, this is actually one of those where we get to have the debate on in, in this cost. You're going to hear in real time where where even the the panelists right have have are, aren't always perfectly aligned. Uh, I'm of the opinion personally. Then in a strict definition, a sync passkey is a multi-factor authenticator or can be used for multi-factor authentication. Uh, and I go back to, right, the only way that you get access to the passkey uh, is by uh, something you know, a pin, right, or something you are because you're touching a biometric sensor to unlock the passkey, uh, private key on, on the device. So in that context, I think it makes this strict definition. Um, I, I think that the risk, the threat model around it, the risks around it are different. And so, so again, whether or not you'd use it in a, this type of environment or that type of environment is really going to come down to your local thing. What what I've tried to do internally within my organization is I have, you know, my regulatory partners in our cyber risk organization, uh, and we've been bringing them along, educating them along, along the journey to help them understand what we're trying to do. What are the benefits? Why is this better than what we have today with passwords plus anything else? Um, and now we're, we're beginning to have conversations with our assessors, with our auditors. Uh, here's why we believe this, uh, this to be the case. And, and we're just trying to get them to, to be convinced this is the thing. What we need as an industry is, is that top level, you know, the, the payment uh, security standards council, for example, uh, you need bodies like that, that, that make a statement. Uh, they're accepted. They're not accepted. They're accepted in this format, but not in that format. They're accepted under these circumstances, but not those circumstances. Like that's a level of clarity that, that we don't have yet today. And I think right now, the best that we can do is continue to be advocates for it, wear our security hats, wear our user experience hats and, and demonstrate that it's better security wise and you get the added benefit of the, the user experience simultaneously. And I don't think your auditors care about the latter, but as pr practitioners, we all should. Dean, and I know I kind of stepped on you a little bit. You were about to get in the mix. That's and okay. Um, yeah, I, I think, I, Tom, I, I appreciate your perspective. Uh, as, as you know, and we've, we've talked about this many times, I disagree with you on a synced passkey being an, uh, a multi-factor authentication um, uh, or any sort of multi-factor authentication because... Um, it's not bound to a specific uh, biometric or inherence factor. Uh, if I was to share a passkey with the folks in this call today, uh, each of you have your own biometric factors that could be used to unlock that passkey. And so to me, that, that doesn't meet the bar. Um, but I also think that, that speaking in terms of factors is no longer necessarily a useful set of terminology for us, right? As we established earlier in the call, multi-factor authentication became a thing because we needed to increase the level of assurance or increase the strength of these single factors of passwords. And so we saw the rise of SMS OTP and OTPs and FIDO U2F initially. Um, and, and those really did represent something that was multi-factor. But now with the rise of passkeys and passkeys being embedded in basically every single device that I own now, um, we need to start thinking in terms of the overall strength of authentication. Uh, I mentioned this to the, to the folks in the call last week that I've been rereading the, the RFC for vectors of trust. 
as a way to communicate the strength of a particular authentication factor uh, to a relying party. And I think that we need to to take a deeper look at that and see how we communicate the strength of a particular passkey and what its inherent properties are to determine whether it's suitable as the only authentication factor or whether additional authentication factors may be needed, uh, or, or maybe it's risk dependent depending on the particular transaction the user is trying to accomplish. If they're trying to accomplish uh, you know, a, a low value financial transaction, say under $100, that risk is very different from trying to process a financial transaction worth a hundred thousand or a million dollars. And so this is where being able to do some differentiation is going to be really important to the long-term health of this industry. Uh, and I don't think we're quite there yet. We don't quite have all the signals we need yet. Uh, I know folks are working on it and folks are pushing internal to the Alliance and W3C uh, to get more of that information to help, uh, relying parties understand the context of the particular passkey, uh, but we're not we're not quite there yet, and and this is going to be an evolution over time. I want yeah. to thank you, sir, for reading RFC specs and uh, enjoying that little soiree of of uh, material. Out of curiosity, <laughs> I went I went on I went on Wikipedia last week after our prep call for this, and uh, I, I tried to find the original patent for two FA. Um, and it was actually uh, the 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 article said that the the patent was actually issued by AT and T, uh, and I I pulled up the patent and um, I saw it has like you know all the the cell phone tower diagrams and everything else and or the phone di tower diagrams and everything else. It was just fascinating to read, uh, you know, kind of going back twenty plus years to see uh, to see kind of how people were thinking about it and. I think SMS OTP gets a really bad rep, but I think it has a really bad rep because it's typically uh, fronted by a password, which has a horrible reputation. Right. Um, and, and so I think, you know, with with device bound pass keys in particular, you know, I, I think synced pass keys are probably the the tip of the spear for most organizations. Uh, and and sh they should be because from a user experience perspective, it's pre it's better. And then device bound passkeys have more specialty use case around financial services, protecting transactions, things like that, requiring more customizations. Um, the, the UAF standard within FIDO itself does provide a ton of customizations that companies that are looking to provide differentiating user experience uh, find value in. But it's not something that you know, every single organization can implement or even should implement. Um, so that, that's where we're, that's where we're seeing the use cases here at Hyper. I think the other, the other side of the coin is that as, um, if your organization allows your, uh, employees to access certain, some, all, whatever the number is, enterprise resource, and I'll go for two classic, simple examples, externally facing your HR application, your pay and benefits applications. If you want your users to log in with a with a sync pass key, because we all know the inherent limitations of passwords, we want to protect that information within their accounts, within their their profiles, as much as we would present prevent protect everything else. Then, when you run into the apples and the googles of the world, where the only model is a sync pass key, as as an RP, I can't tell Apple and Google to change their model. I, I have no ability to to require or mandate or force a sync pass key or sorry device bound pass key to be created. In that context, I'm now living within the, the platform realm that's around me, right? Even password managers, my, my, my team members in Target use password managers in their personal lives, right? And if, if they're storing their credentials uh, in a password manager, uh, I have to deal with that today. And so I, I think as you think about sync pass keys, you're either going to have to accept them and then figure out where they fit in your environment, again, with the risk, with the risk engine, how you want to identify risk, under what transactions or what types of transactions you want to use them. I think you're going to have to do that, or you're going to alienate those users on those platforms because you're going to choose not to support them, which means now the user has to be is forced to go downgrade back to that old password. Which again, we we're starting with the premise that we don't want them anymore. So it's a terrible position for your for your users. And one thing I've learned is the user experience always wins. Um, when you know when the first devices with fingerprint readers and Touch ID, Face ID were coming out. It was, it was similar concerns in the industry, like how is this secure, so on and so forth. But then the user experience benefit just very quickly got everybody aligned. You know, when when people could log, 
log into bank A 10 times faster than they could into bank B, it very quickly started to uh, get adoption. And I think a similar thing will happen with pass keys. And I think a common theme am amongst the folks in the FIDO Alliance that even this group is, this is where you know a risk engine type of capability is going to start becoming even more important because you're going to start, now you're looking at different types of uh, credentials. And well, if I was trying to create a Venn diagram of passwords and I couldn't, they're just passwords, right? So now that you have these differences, you have to be able to evaluate them accordingly. Yeah, I think where you can create that Venn diagram is, you know, with passwords, I would argue that most users don't use a password manager of any sort. And so, um, you know, your Venn diagram is passwords that are created by a password manager, which are generally good and passwords that are not created by a password manager, which are generally pretty bad. Um, and so that the nature should be to push users toward that password manager, or, or maybe we call it a credential manager these days because now the support of pass keys, but that is, um, that's sort of the natural transition that we want users to make to, to pick up those password managers or credential managers and use them. And then we can transition them in, into pass keys. Um, uh, Boyan, you mentioned before about the history of 2FA. Uh, I'd encourage you to go back to the ID Pro body of knowledge. Um, my colleague Khaled Zaki and I wrote an article about a year ago on uh, multi-factor authentication for the ID Pro body of knowledge uh, and went through the history. And actually, uh, second factors originated in the late 60s in the banking industry in England. Um, AT&T was the first to patent it, um, but it wasn't necessarily the first uh, uh uh, use of a second factor. It was, you had a physical card and you had a pin and that was your multi-factor authentication back in the day. So I would say the government still uses that exact same method. <laughs> <laughs> so part of the, the topic for this, this whole LinkedIn live is as well as uh, it being from theory to adoption. So I think we've hit quite a bit of our theories. I think we've given some of, of our opinions. And I think we, we've we also given quite a bit of what the future and, and I think the threat modeling and, and obviously the risk services are are all key components. Um, but what would be the recommendations? And we kind of put a couple slides so um, we can talk about what the adoption would be like. And, and obviously, Tom, you've got some experience in your, your you know world from the last three years of maybe trying to deploy and get others to use. Um, Boyan, you and I, we have experience with our customers actually getting it actually deployed and, and the approach is used. Dean, um, I'm not sure where you've gotten to actually be <laughs> part of the, the deployment aspects, but I'm pretty sure you have some additional, um, you know, uh, commentary on this topic. So we, we are at about seven minutes remaining out of the 45. I, I'm, I'm glad we're eating up all the time. Um, so usually from a deployment context, when we talk about things, it's the, a crawl, walk, run. Um, how do we start doing this? And and I think it's pretty safe to say this is almost like the same model that was applied to just getting users into MFA into organizations. Uh, Boyan, do you agree? Disagree? Yeah, you know, I, when when people ask me like, "Hey, how should I get started with passkeys?" I always recommend go with less friction. Get the user buy in. Um, there's always a carrot stick approach. I always prefer the carrot approach uh, with with users. And, and so what I recommend is like, hey, if you want to get started with passkeys, deploy them alongside your password-based authentication right now. And if your app currently has MFA with SMS or OTP, keep that as it is, but replace the password or make an alternative available to the password with a passkey. And this is like the best way that I think companies can just get started. It, it doesn't add significant friction to the user experience. It's purely opt in. Um, and then what this does is if you're if if you've implemented this well, ideally you have all the data available to you so you can monitor and track who is opting in to use pass keys, how they're using it, um, any issues that they're having, which then allows you to take further steps. Tom? Yeah, we, we, we did this approach. I, I would say um, uh, being an early adopter, we started our, our journey in 2019. Uh, we started support, supporting FIDO as a second factor in 2019. In 2021, 
Uh, we deployed uh, FIDO as a primary authenticator. So using platform authenticators on our devices that we had already at, at our fingertips. At that time, every pa every what we call a passkey today was a device-bound passkey inherently. We didn't call them device-bound passkey at the time, but but if you look at today's model, the, the label that we would use in 2021 is a device-bound passkey. So uh, we actually uh, chose to sort of skip the, the, the plus portion, the second factor, because we believe that device-bound passkey was inherently two factors immediately. And so we actually took away a lot of authentication uh, from our, a lot of stepped up authentications from our users right away for those that converted to, to using our, our uh, FIDO solution on day one. Now, here we are beginning in 2022 and into today. Now we've got the concept of sync versus device-bound passkeys. And we're, we're basically for the sync population, people that are getting new devices today, new, new, new mobile phones primarily. Uh, we're at this phase right now where we're trying to reintroduce the step up for them under certain circumstances. We're evaluating what we're protecting behind the authentication and where we need to, we're, we're putting an SMS or other legacy MFA behind it. And, and where we believe that a sync passkey is still good enough to get in, we're going to let them have that single, single login experience right away. Of course, Dean, I'm, think, a, I'm not leaving you out, Dean. <laughs> no, that's all right. I, I think this is the, the right model. And, you know, uh, through the Enterprise Plant Working Group uh, at FIDO, we, we wrote a series of five papers this year about um, moving enterprises to pass keys. And this is the exact model that we talk about. It's, it's think about the risk, think about what you're trying to protect, just like Tom said. Um, and, and, and start to introduce pass keys to displace the password and the SMS OTP. Um, but think carefully about what it is you're protecting, what your regulatory environment is, et cetera, so that you choose the appropriate model, whether it's device bound or synced, um, uh, it, as you make this transition. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and I'll then, go with, so sorry, Boyana, I was just going to say that we've, we've actually followed this kind of pattern with some, some customers and saw an outrageous amount of success uh, with how many users did select to opt in and actually took that, that path. And it wasn't a forced scenario. So it was a, a really good response and it actually was a little bit even um, slightly different than what the Fido UX team had recommended, which was don't, don't prompt a user as they're logging in this customer chose to prompt the user as logging in saying, Hey, do you want this lovely new benefit? And it got adopted more, more rapidly than expected. Sorry, Boyan. Yeah. And then the, the walk phase, I think Tom, this is where you, you kind of started out because it was before the concept of um, sync pass keys was really super popular, but where once a user goes through, you know, MFA, they can enroll a device bound pass key and then you can make that their primary UX. Um, and then, you know, this is where organizations can choose like, Hey, do I make this, um, you know, the only way a user can log in or do I make it still optional where I, where I have the fallback of the le legacy way available to the user. And this is where the risk engine again comes in where like, you know, if, if a user has been using a device bound pass key for a year all of a sudden they show up and they're typing in a password and doing SMS, you know, the red light, the light should go off um, for, for that user in particular. And, and maybe we should require additional context to be made available as we evaluate them. Um, but then that should ideally be a very, you know, limited set of scenarios and, and, and times that that happens where um, we can actually take the time to properly look at those signals Whereas right now, you know, the primary method of authenticating is uh, is using shared secrets, and we're constantly having to look at, you know, millions of authentication requests every single minute, and trying to evaluate whether or not they're malicious or not. Whereas with a with a passkey, ha having a user uh, having to use a mobile device or a device to authenticate, like a like a token having that physical device access prevents so many attacks. Um, and this is where we recommend kind of in the walk phase, make the device map passkey the primary UX once the user has it enrolled, but still provide alternatives to user, but closely monitor them. And I think this makes really good sense. Um, you know, the, the device bound passkey challenge though is that you are at this point uh, with platform and, and um, uh, credential manager limitations, you're limited to UAF for those device-bound passkeys unless you're using an external hardware security key. 
Um, and I think most users aren't going to have a YubiKey in their possession. Though I would argue that if you really take your security seriously, you should probably have a YubiKey or a Fashion Key or a Titan Key and use that to protect your credential manager, whether it's Apple as a platform or Google or uh, or Dashlane or 1Password or what have you. Um, and, and this is the model I use myself where I protect um, those credential manager accounts with a hardware security key as the, the ultimate way to get into those things. Tell me anything you want to add on this one. We're going to get to the wrap up. I think we're already one minute over. So oh, good. All right. And then the last phase, which is the run, because we all like running. Um, I don't know. Going on. I hate running. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but I do it, but I don't like it. But, you know, the, the one area where we kind of see the run phase is more, more sport for higher risk scenarios where you kind of have a device bound passkey that can do things like transaction verification. So this is traditional UAF in particular where you can have a cryptographic signing of transactions as part of the authentication request itself. And this is to, you know, if I'm sending a million dollars to someone, you know, making sure that that, uh, that who I'm sending it to and the amount uh, is not changed in the middle is super important. And that's really, you know, for, for highly regulated use cases, uh, financial services um, or areas where you just need that additional level of trust and we're seeing a particular interest in this uh, with regards to the payment services directive requirements in Europe, especially where uh, organizations want uh, need to have cryptographic signing as part of the uh, authentication request. It's recommended. It, I don't think it's fully required yet, but I think that's a matter of time at this point. So with that being that we're two minutes over, not that I wanted to just hard stop us all, but uh, just trying to be within bounds. Um, I will give a quick cycle for uh, final words. Dean, you want to add anything as we wrap this up? Yeah. Um, start your passkey journey now. Um, there's no reason not to start now. Um, you can you can start crawling. You can start walking. But, but start somewhere uh, because... The reality is this is where we are collectively heading for primary authentication for users. Um, it's easier to use. It's more secure than passwords. The properties are better than passwords. It is not a risk-free endeavor, uh, as we've said, but everybody should start down this path and on this journey as soon as possible, because ultimately our job as relying parties is to protect the users that we serve. And this is one way which we can do that. Hey, Tom? Yeah, it was said before, if you're not using any 2FA today, shame on you, number one. And number two, go to Passkeys now. If you're using, uh, you know, OTP in any format uh, on top of passwords, your Passkeys can provide a better experience. Uh, Bojan mentioned the carrot and the stick before. Uh, this is a carrot. This is a great carrot opportunity. You can deliver a lot of value for users. The worst stick you can get is be part of a breach story where you're doing it in response to a breach. And so, um, you know, would never wish that upon anybody, but but don't let the carrot become a breach event where you're now forced to do it as quickly as you needed to because you're, you're too late. That's right. If you're part of a security team, there's very few situations where in your career you get to improve the user experience and security of your users. This is probably the most obvious one that you can do today and achieve significant results. So it is very much recommended that you just start on this journey anywhere in whatever capacity you can and learn from it and evolve from there. And so it's it's an exciting time. And thank you guys for making the time to speak with us today. Thanks yes, de definitely. Thank you, Tom uh, and Dean. Thank you as well, as I know you're prepping for your trip and you're going to have a wonderful time. Uh, and I appreciate you squeezing this in just before you're uh, taking care of that. Boyan, thank you for squeezing it in as I know you are enjoying the the luxuries of a hotel room while we do this. And for everybody who is listening and or, or watching, uh, hopefully you have a wonderful week and or great holidays. And I, I thank you everybody for uh, participating. Have a wonderful one. Thank you for hosting.